I'm Enrique Cerna. Next on Conversations, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, the prominent cancer physician, researcher, and award-winning science writer, is the author of The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer. He chronicles cancer's history, the treatments, and the challenges of fighting this deadly disease. Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Dr. Mukherjee, welcome to Seattle. Welcome to Conversations. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Your book is doing quite well in the New York Times bestseller list. Um, I, how did you manage to write this book and at the same time everything that you do? Because you're a researcher, uh, you're an assistant professor at Columbia. You have patients yes. as well. Well, I wrote this book actually through a span of many years. It was a six-year project. Um, and I think I, I, I wrote it uh, bits and pieces at a time. Um, the real challenge was, you know, how do you tell a story that's 4,000 years old or, or spans 4,000 years and, and has hundreds of characters that go in and out? How do, you, how do you narrate that story? And the way I did it really is to put it together like a story uh, and to do it piece by piece. And, and, and I think part of the reason I could do it is because I felt there was an urgency to doing it. I mean, we hadn't had this history written before. Talk about that urgency, because yeah. really it was prompted by one of your patients, a woman who was suffering from abdominal cancer, That's and, and she had had relapses. Yep. How did that and come about? She said, you know, she was a, a psychologist, um, an incredibly brave woman, um, actually had sought out uh, and found a, a trial for herself that uh, what had, and had an incredible response to this medicine, to Gleevec. Um, and then she had come to Boston after about three years being on that drug and had relapsed, and she had relapsed again. And at one point of time, she said, you know, I'm willing to go on with battling cancer, but I need to know what it is that I'm fighting. And it was a very, it was a very pivotal moment for this book because I, I said to myself, you know, not only can I not answer her question, I couldn't point her to a resource. I couldn't point her to another book which would give her the big answer to the question, which is, what was the story of cancer? When did it first come about? What happens next? Where are we going? Why are we here? Um, and, you know, and the statistics. I mean, everyone, we're all going to be touched by it, and yeah. yet we didn't have a history. You know, the statistics, in fact, in the beginning of the book here, uh, one of the opening pages, in 2010, about 600,000 Americans and more than 7 million humans around the world will die of cancer. Here in the U.S., one in three women and one in two men will develop cancer during their lifetime. A quarter of all American deaths and about 15% of all deaths worldwide will be attributed to cancer. And in some nations, cancer will surpass heart disease to become the most common cause of death. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's just stunning to yeah. me. Just... And, and isn't, it, isn't it incredible that, that for something that is so common and so large, and that looms so large on our lives um, that there wasn't really a, a story. We, 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 you know, patients went in to this world of cancer, as people have described it, as if it, as if a cold, with no history, with no past, and therefore no, fu no understanding of the future. And that, that was what the urgency was in writing the book. A biography, and it was really stepping back in time. But you've done this in a way that it's, it's, uh, it's not, there's science in it. Yeah, but you really tell it through everyday people and the people that have been a part of this as well. Let's talk about that history. How far back in time are we talking about cancer showing up? Well, we actually don't know exactly because the word cancer doesn't arise um, until relatively late in human history. And where did that come from? Um, so, in fact, Hippocrates um, very fantastically imagined cancer as a crab crawling under the skin, you know, the solid tumor was like a crab buried under the sand, and the blood vessels spread around the, the cancer were like the legs of the crab dug around the sand, and therefore it shares the same name as the astrological sign, cancer. 
Um, and, and, you know, it reminds us, it's a, it's, a, it's a richly metaphorical description. I don't think Hippocrates literally thought there was a crab buried under the skin. And these metaphors, you know, come over and over again in time around cancer. So that's when the first... Pretty accurate, though. Yeah, it, it is pretty accurate, you know. The, but, it, the, but it goes back to, what, the 16th century? Well, the, the, there's some work, some things that you found there? That's right. So, so, I mean, the first time that we understand cancer as a pathological entity, and we understand that there are cells involved in it, and there's an overgrowth of cells, etc., is really from the 19th century. Um, but the first time that we, there's, a, there's a clinical case that resembles what we might call cancer today is from 2500 BC. Mm. Um, so that is 4,000 odd years ago, um, when an Egyptian uh, physician uh, describes a case which remarkably sounds like breast cancer, um, and that's the that's probably the very first time that the word that that cancer is described again. The word doesn't exist at that point of time. When we talk about cancer, it has this um, I think a stigma and image of fear. I would imagine as a doctor having to deliver that news, also as a patient having to hear that the the delivery and then having that being told that you have it. It has to be the most difficult and scariest thing. It, it is one of the most, people often say it is, the, it is a watershed moment in their lives. Encountering that word for themselves or their loved one um, it really redefines living for them. What is cancer? So cancer is not one disease, but a family of diseases. Um, but these diseases are linked at a re relatively fundamental cellular level. And these all are diseases in which uh, there is a disordered growth of cells. Um, typically, um, it is when cells don't know when to stop growing um, and they begin to grow out of control. Occasionally, that growth can be quite rapid, actually, but sometimes the growth can be relatively slow. Um, but the common feature behind all of them is this overgrowth or the uh, uncontrolled, unbridled growth of cells. Kind of the mutation and it continues to... Exactly. And so the question is, well, why do cells uh, grow without control? Um, and the answer actually it was a chilling answer that was provided by several scientists, including Harold Varmus and Michael Bishop in the 1970s. The answer is, well, there are genes, which are normal, there are a set of instructions in every cell that tell cells when to grow, normal cells, when to grow and when to stop growing. And in a cancer cell, those signals have been distorted, mutated. Um, and therefore, in fact, interestingly, the very genes that allow our embryos to grow, our brains to grow, our hands to grow, if you take those very same genes, which are vital to our normal growth, and you mutate them, if you distort them, then you get cancer. Do we all carry these genes? Absolutely. Each so, one of us carries every one of these genes. Is already, I mean, of course, there's a small family of cancers that comes from viruses, and viruses can cause cancer by unleashing these genes, but many cancers are caused by genes that are already in, in you and in me. And in really, just in some people, then they tend to mutate and grow and grow. That's right. So it's, it's not only a disease of mutations, but it's also an evolutionary disease in the sense that, you know, there's one mutation, and then another mutation is added on, and a third mutation, and much like bacteria might grow out through evolution, or much like a species might grow out through evolution, cancer cells also have this process in which they grow so out. So we, each and every one of us, carries. That's right. Each and every one of us carries a propensity or a vulnerability to cancer. Cancer is part of our genetic inheritance. And then is it then sparked, or is this still what we don't know yet, by, um, you know, the surroundings, things out in nature, uh, what we eat? what we smoke, what we drink. Absolutely. So some of it is, some cancers in particular are very clearly sparked by these um, exogenous events, so-called carcinogens, and you, you mentioned some of the big ones, tobacco, um, you know, things that we ingest, things that we eat, um, radiation, high doses of radiation, and so forth. Um, but then there are other forms of cancer in which we actually can't identify. Every time a cell divides, um, it make, can make a mistake in copying genes. Um, in fact, this is a very valuable property because this is what allows nature to generate diversity and thereby create evolution, the same, this small little error rate. But if that error happens to strike one of these genes that controls cell division, that really keeps the, the checks and balances on how cells grow, 
then you unleash cancer. It's so complex, and I would take it that most people that, as you, that are researching and looking for treatments and cures and all of this, wish that there was a virus that caused it, so know, you could I deal know. with it that way. It'd be much, much simpler. I know. Well, in, in the 1960s, there was a very powerful, very powerful hope, almost a seductive hope, that it would turn out to be an exogenous virus, and like many other viral diseases, like smallpox and polio, you could eliminate the virus and therefore eliminate cancer. And it was really, as I said, it sent a chill up the spines of biologists when they realized that although certainly there are viruses that cause cancer, many cancers are caused by these, by these internal genes, this kind of this idea of, of this being a genetic uh, disease and inher part of our inheritance. Let's talk about um, as the history, the biography here, and the people. The yes. people that have really done so much to try to uh, find a treatment, to bring uh, research, much needed research, up to uh, the government, to pour money and all of these things. Of all the people, who stands out the most on all this? Well, one person who really threads together, actually I would say there are two people who thread together the book, um, and I chose them for very specific reasons. One of them is Sidney Farber. Um, he was a pathologist who, through a series of accidents, uh, discovered um, the f one of the first forms of chemotherapy. Um, and then using these chemotherapies began to understand that you could cure a certain vari variant of leukemia, childhood lymphoblastic leukemia, and the idea that you could cure this very lethal, fatal disease launched a kind of optimism around the war on cancer. So that was Sidney Farber. Um, and then there was Mary Lasker. Mary Lasker was a close confidant of Sidney Farber. She was a philanthropist, um, an entrepreneur, and she became obsessed um, with changing the geography, the landscape, the political landscape of cancer in America. And she liaised with Sidney Farber, again, to persuade Nixon to launch the war on cancer. And this was back in late 60s, early 70s, that's right? That's right, that's right. I reproduced in the book, actually, an advertisement from 1969 by these, this group of people. They began to be called the Laskerites after, after Mary Lasker. And um, there's an advertisement that they bring out in the New York Times which says, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the subtitle in that is, uh, you know, why don't we try to cure cancer by America's 200th birthday? What a wonderful gift that would be. Uh, Haven't got it yet. Yeah, exactly. But even before then, there were others that had also had some impact here, particularly in, in dealing with well, chemotherapy. Even war yes. had some impact in mustard gas. Tell me about that. Well, it, it's a fascinating story, and I, I, I talk about it in the book, that in fact, the very first chemotherapies, even before Farber had, fu had, fu had found them, were actually developed out of war gases. It turned out that a mustard gas, which was used in the First and Second World War, has a peculiar property. It will um, kill the cells of your bone marrow first um, and often spare some other cells in your body. So in other words, it kills, it kills the cells that, that divide um, in, the, in the body. It kills growing cells. And, um, and pathologists who were examining uh, and performing autopsies on, on gas victims, mustard gas victims in the war, had figured this out in the 1920s. And it was in the 1940s that uh, Gilman and Goodman, among other people, said, well, if this gas can kill growing cells in the body, then could it not kill growing cancer cells? And that's why we, we use uh, you know, mustard gas and its variants um, as chemotherapy. An interesting story, someone told me the other day, I was, I was relating this story, and they, and they said to me, well, but that's, that's ancient history. Right? We don't use mustard gas, or you know, we don't use war gases to treat cancer. And that very week, Enrique, I had used uh, this um, a mustine to treat, really? uh, treat, treat cancer. It's still used today. And what kind of cancer were you treating? Well, so it, it works for a variety of cancers. Lymphomas are very responsive to, um, you know, t to mustard gas. And this is, again, a reminder that this is not one disease but many diseases. Other cancers don't seem to respond at all very well to these, uh, to these chemicals. And, and that's what makes this so difficult and complex. Not only the fact, as we spoke earlier, about the fact that you wish it was a virus and you yes. could treat it that way, but it is so different. I, I take it that if a woman has breast cancer compared to someone that might have colon cancer, cancer or testicular cancer, these types of things. Well, it's not, only, not only is there diversity uh, between cancers, the level of diversity within cancers is daunting. So just to give you an example, um, a single breast cancer may have a completely different spectrum of mutations than another breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes people say, well, you know, if that's the case, 
why don't we just throw up our hands and say it's just too complex? Why don't we become nihilistic? Well, there are two answers to that. I mean, number one is that although there are differences, there are still common principles. Um, and we're discovering that slowly, piece by piece. And the analogy that I sometimes give, it's a little bit like the human face. There are millions of different faces, but there's a fundamental geometry to every face. And we need to figure out what that geometry is for breast cancer, for instance. That's one feature. But what's, what's even more amazing is that it's now turning out, and I talk about this actually with a specific story in the book, it's turning out that in fact, when you lift up the veils and you begin to look at this internal genetic anatomy of cancer, a breast cancer might resemble a stomach cancer, mm. or a leukemia might resemble a sarcoma, and those two things might respond to the same treatment. So in other words, we are reorganizing the whole universe of cancers such that instead of looking at them under the microscope at face value, we're looking at them genetically, we're looking at them anatomically, and trying to figure out whether common medicines might work in some species and not in other species. And that's, that's a big, big new development. Tell me about William Halstead. Halstead was a, and I, you know, there's a, there's a whole chapter in the book about Halstead. Halstead was a man uh, driven by a very singular idea, and that is that he was interested in curing breast cancer. Um, and he thought to himself, well, you know, the reason that patients are still not being cured is that because surgeons are not cutting aggressively enough. Mm. They're not removing enough tissue. So Halstead, in this, in this moment, in trying to desperately cure breast cancer began to increase the sizes of dissections, sizes of the surgery, becoming more and more aggressive until he got to a point of time that he was excavating, removing surgically a vast amount of tissue, um, leaving all these physical side effects. And ultimately, it took 90 years before it was disproved that, this, uh, that, that the idea that cutting more would be curing more in this form of cancer. But was he the one that really started the approach of mastectomies? He started, well, mastectomies had predated Halstead, so there were m many mastectomies. But what Halstead did is he took mastectomy to its next level, and he invented uh, what he called a radical mastectomy, the, the most aggressive surgery for breast cancer that, you know, that he really invented. Um, incidentally, Halstead um, was an amazing person. I, I tell the story, and this is why this he, he had a lot of issues. <laughs> he had many issues, exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, he was first of all, he was an amazing surgeon. Right. Uh, he he really he really started. He, he's the he's the yeah. he's the godfather in many more ways than one. He's the godfather of American surgery. The fact that we use gloves uh, in surgery today is a legacy of Halstead. You know, the discipline, the training program. But just one word about Halstead. You know, he went to Europe early on in his life, and he became interested in anesthesia. And at that point of time, they were using cocaine for anesthesia. And so Halstead thought to himself, well, before I start using cocaine on my patients, I'm going to experiment with it on myself just to make sure I get the right dose. And he became an addict uh, of cocaine. And to detox uh, himself, he decided to use morphine. So then he became an addict to morphine. Oh, so he was then vacillating between cocaine and morphine, and cocaine and morphine, meanwhile performing these incredible surgeries. But it's, it's a reminder of how disciplined Halstead was, not only surgically, but sort of mentally, psychically, that he could be addicted, but he had toned his addiction to the point of time that he could perform fully as a surgeon while dosing himself on these very, very addictive drugs. How, has there now been the, the move away from the surgical procedures that, you know, go out and cut everything, more of a tempered move on that or what? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, surgery is still the mainstay of treatment for many forms of solid cancer, the, the kinds of cancers, breast cancer, uh, uh, lung cancer, stomach cancer, etc. Surgery is the front line of therapy. We can, if we can remove the whole thing before it spreads, uh, that is, that is a curative uh, regimen, um, and so surgeons play a central role. But that said, you know, the idea that if you cut more, you would cure more, that idea has come under a lot of suspicion. We're still going through trials to figure it out in various forms of cancer, but in breast cancer, for instance, very clear that that's not the case. Well, let's talk a bit more about chemotherapy. I mean, it is such a, um, it takes so much out of someone, uh, the vomiting, the just... Uh, radiation too as well yes. as leaving people tired and, and uh, how you try to recover from all these things. But I, I take it that 30, 40 years ago it was far more difficult. Maybe things have are a bit easier now, and it has to do a lot with the drugs that help to deal with all of these Absolutely. things? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's important not to forget that the reason, one of the crucial advances in chemotherapy, 
um, was, the, was anti-nausea medicines, was actually um, the capacity to take care of patients with their, in terms of their nausea, the loss of appetite, the loss of will, even antidepressants, uh, you know, a whole armamentarium of drugs that don't tackle the cancer, but in fact tackle the symptoms around the cancer. And this, of course, gets us into the, the role of palliative care and hospice care um, in cancer as well. So I often tell people, well, chemotherapy is just one tool in an armamentarium of tools. Uh, there's anti-nausea medicines, anti-pain medicines, uh, you know, as we talked about palliative care, hospice care, psychiatric medicine, psychological help. I mean, taking care of a cancer patient in the fullest sense involves all of this. It's a very holistic quality about taking care of a cancer what patient. What has happened to the war on cancer? This was something really during when we talked about Mary Lasker and uh, Richard Nixon and the funding and all of the efforts there, there were, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier, the fact that the, you know, doctors believed that they could come up with a cure for cancer you know, well before the end of the century, but no, it hasn't happened. Well, the idea of the war on cancer was actually it criticized right up front because it was considered very premature. Uh, this was um, someone, many people have used this analogy. Uh, Bruce Chabner has used this analogy um, and, and say, in saying that declaring a war on cancer in 1971 was like trying to launch a rocket without knowing Newton's laws. Hmm. Um, in other words, we knew very little at that point of time about the fundamental nature of the cancer cell. We didn't know why cancer happened. We didn't know what the molecular aberrations were in a cancer cell. And here we were saying, you know, we really, we really don't need to know all of this. Um, if we somehow, you know, maximize chemotherapy um, or various other kinds of therapies, we'll obliterate the cancer cell and thereby we'll, we'll eliminate cancer, eradicate it. Um, I think now we have a much more tempered understanding of the war. The word war was seductive, it was tantalizing, but now we're more tempered about our understanding of it. And I think, to be fully honest, the war continues. Um, uh, you know, we might not call it a war, but it's still, you know, there still remains a frontier, and there are many, many different ways of tackling cancer that we're dealing with even today. As a researcher, what is happening now that gives you hope? Well, many things. I'll point out some arenas that are important. Um, well, one of them, I would say, is, is uh, you know, we've learned so much about cancer prevention um, that, uh, that there's, a, there's an enormous effort, an appropriate effort, to put a lot of focus on cancer prevention, identifying carcinogens, but also using screening tests, which is another form of prevention, um, such as a mammogram or a pap smear. Uh, to prevent cancer before it becomes invasive um, uh, and then develops into a more full-blown form. So that's one sector. Um, another sector, very promising new uh, arena is, and I talk a lot, little bit about these, is the development of molecular targeted therapies. These are drugs that only kill cancer cells. They're still chemotherapies, but they exquisitely, with exquisite specificity, kill cancer cells and spare the rest of the normal cells of the body. And this is sort of the wave of, of the future, finding drugs with this kind of specificity. Is there a genetic hereditary connection? Oh, absolutely. Well, there are deep genetic and hered hereditary connections. We know for breast cancer, for instance, we actually know even some of the genes. BRCA1, BRCA2 are important genes that uh, are, are responsible for hereditary breast cancer. But here's something that's interesting. If you take the entire universe of just hereditary breast cancer, so in other words, breast cancer where you know that there's a family history and thereby there's a genetic component, BRCA1 and BRCA2 still only explain about 25%, maybe even less, of these hereditary breast cancers. So it just reminds us that there are so many new genes to be discovered, so little that we know not only about the genes, but about the pathways of these genes, and of course about the host, about the immune system, about the ways that the host is interacting with the cancer cell. What do you tell people that they have a family member or they themselves suddenly get this diagnosis that they have a cancer? Well, I think much, much like there is no archetypal cancer, much like there's a deep diversity in cancer, there's a deep diversity in the psyche of patients. And you have, as a doctor, I think you're responsible to negotiate with that psyche to figure out what the goals are um, of, of a patient and find out what, how best you can answer those goals. So, so there, is no, there is no one conversation, there is no template, there is no archetype that I often, that I, that I arrive at. Uh, you know, a 78-year-old woman with breast cancer is very different, uh, or can be very different, from a 27-year-old woman with breast cancer. Um, and the, the tumors behave differently, the responses behave very differently. So I try to take a very pers personalized approach.
to every cancer. And family? And families, yeah, and a personalized approach to families. The dynamics of families are very different. I mean, I remember this case in which um, a, a man uh, came in to see me. He, he had a, a, a variation of a leukemia with his family. In the context of his family, he said he wanted aggressive therapy, and I had just finished writing my note. I'd finished everything about it, and there was a knock on my door, and he came back, and he said, you know what? Actually, I don't want it. I, it was just, you know, outside my family. I want something actually quite different. And so it's a reminder that families play a very crucial role in the dynamics of patients, and you have to contend with that. You have to understand not only the patient, but the psyche of the family. It seems like you have to deal so much there's so much to deal with here. There is the medical side and how you treat someone, but then there is the psychological and emotional side. Well, in fact, those two are not two sides. In fact, they're part of the same side. Oh, part of the thing. Yeah, and unless we realize that, I mean, I think, you know, that's been hard for cancer doctors, I think, for myself, for others. We're all human. We try to separate these sides out. But in fact, taking care of a patient means integrating back the medical side and the psychic side and the psychiatric side. And that's what we still struggle to do in medicine. And are doctors getting better at doing that? Well, that's a good question. I hope they're getting better. Uh, you know, we're, we're, I think we're trying to get better. I think, you know, one of the things has to do with regaining the trust of patients and that there was a rift in that trust in the 1980s between cancer doctors and their patients. And I think we're trying to regain that rift. It's our responsibility. Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, fascinating book, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer. Thank you for your time and continued success, and I hope in your research you have some success to be able to help find a cure one day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sir. Pleasure. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.